At ADP, we understand the importance of building the right team and offer the data insights to help. Just as importantly, our AI technology helps you pay the team accurately. Grow stronger with ADP. HR, talent, time, and payroll. Hey, we get it. You don't want to be hearing a progressive commercial right now. So let us tell you something you do want to hear. You are intelligent. You make all the right decisions. You were smart before smart was cool, and you made it cool again. You have a wealth of knowledge, and you are so very clever. <laughs> I bet you already knew I was going to say that, you genius. There. Don't you feel better? You'll also feel better when you hear you could save big when you switch to Progressive. But I'm pretty sure you already knew that, too. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Yes. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name is Stuart Wright, and today's guest is Mark Archer. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. We've come to talk about your documentary, Don't Go Gentle, a film about idols, haven't we? I guess. <laughs> I'm here for whatever questions you want to ask. Well, I'm going to focus on that. If you, if you decide you want to talk about something else, I'll have to follow you, but I'm not ready yeah. for that bit yet. <laughs> So before we go into details then, I mean, it's, it's bleeding obvious from the title, but do you want to give us what, what your brief synopsis is about this documentary? Yeah, so um, the, fil- the film, uh, obviously, it captures their rise. Um, the, reason, the reason I started the film was um, because they were a bunch of Bristol lads who'd done good. They'd, you know, they'd hit, the, hit some problems personally. And when they just started breaking into London, I thought that was just an inspiring story enough to, to mm. roll with it. But the film kind of turned into something a lot more. I mean, originally back then it was a short film. So the film goes uh, and, and it kind of rides the wave, the, you know, the wave that they hit, but also the domino effect it had on the, the community of fans. Um, who sort of opened up the whole topic of mental health? And well, let's let's get into that. I mean, just more. It was more just so essential. So essentially, it's 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 a rock documentary, but it's it's a rock documentary with um, with bells and whistles on because it it focuses on the people that follow the band. It focuses on the band and the tribulations of being in a band, the struggles, the family, the family ties, the family pressures, and, and yeah. obviously grief is a big thing that features quite high on in, yeah, in the narrative yeah. of this. Um, and it's raw. It's raw. Yeah, indeed, say. indeed. Yeah. That's one of one of the you know it's one of the uh, and we'll, we'll talk about how you, how you tackle that. So you, you you say you started off with a short film. So did a short film get made and released, or did you start making a short no. film and it just mushroomed into a feature? No, that was how I think I got their manager to agree to me doing something because it was like I just got this short film idea. I, you know, I, I hadn't shot. I'd shot a short film before, but it never released and. So I was like, can I just join you? I've got this little idea. He said, yeah, sure. And then I just kept, this is when they, you know, they weren't big at the time. They, I, I'd just seen something in the band that I wanted to tell that story. And uh, as they snowballed, I just kept filming. I just mm. kept turning up <laughs> to, to gigs, turning up at things that they were doing. And there was a point where it was like, Mark, Mark, like, what, what are you doing? Are you? What, like what are you making <laughs> right, okay. yeah and I, and I kind of said I've got no idea what I'm making went away um thought about it and um and that's kind of when it became yeah it became bigger it became a feature idea at that point what in the sense that you were purposely making a feature and documentary yeah there was, there was a con- yeah there was a conversation <laughs> um I, I met Lindsay Melbourne, who's one of the producers on the film, but also a, an amazing photographer. Mm. And I'd approached Lindsay to to use her photographs in the short film. And at that point, she we met in a pub in I think it was a New Cross in London. Mm. And she we got talking, and she said, "Have you heard of the Afghan? Uh, you know, the fan group." Um, and and they were like thirty people on Facebook. It wasn't. I, I hadn't heard of them. I had no idea. And she was like, "You might want to. You might want to look at this for the film." Mm. And then 
as soon as we started looking at that, and as soon as we started seeing idols sort of, it's not in the film, but they got picked, Foo Fighters, you know, picked them to support them at the O2. Like just mad things were happening. Mm. Jules Holland was around that time. You know, things were just going off. And, and when that alongside the, what was going on with the fan community, it was like, okay, maybe we should, let's just uh, drop all worries and concerns we had. And I think their manager, you know, I, I showed him a bit of a treatment that I did, like a, I pulled together and he said, you can make it, but as, as long as it's fucking good. And I was like, okay, I don't know if it's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be that good, yeah. but I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. And so we just thought, yeah, we'll drop everything and, and go for it. So that's what we did. So in that sense, the band weren't, weren't having creative control of the documentary. then. So amazingly, um, when we did this sort of the long sit down chat with Joe when we filmed for the filming, yeah. um, he said at the end, I will have as much or as little creative control as you want in this film. I don't need any, I don't, you know, it's yours. This is your creative journey. So use me if you want me, but I'm like, this is yours. Mm. So, um, so yeah, it's been, it's kind of been all our, our creation and, and the band, <laughs> just let me in which was amazing yeah i guess i guess it's that i mean it, it marries up with the kind of people that you portray in the film mm. because it's it, that feels like a very truthful way for them to approach a documentary about themselves yeah 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 because i guess i i guess you know there is a separation between the film and the band uh what i mean by that is they haven't had any input in it they've let this grow by itself mm. and um and did they've let us work and they've just been they've just been like oh like, there's a uk cinema run oh that's cool like do you know what i mean like they, oh, wow that, all, that, that little involvement yeah 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 so it's all been from from afar and it's kind of um you know i i've known i've known them for a long time now um john especially the drummer he was we went to school together okay so it's been a very weird relationship <laughs> in terms of when I see John over the last four years, we rarely speak about the film. The film's just been so separated from my personal relationship mm. with him and them. Uh, and like I said, they kind of just let me go to work on it. And then I would just pick dates that I, I thought would be good to capture for the film points along the way. And that was that really. Um, yeah, about four years later and we're done. So with, with that in mind then, I mean, obviously going to see them perform and in various places and significant events, there's still the process of getting the essential talking heads and stuff so you get an mm. appropriate narrative from the band of what you're trying to say as much as mm. what is actually happening says for itself. Were you shaping a narrative while interviewing or was the narrative shaping what you do next time you turn up? No, we, 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 like I said before, um, I, I filmed quite a lot with them. Mm. Just, I turned up and filmed gigs that I wanted to film. I feel like I needed to let the story unfold more because we were filming as they were, as, as the band were growing and as the group were growing. So we just kept filming. At that point, I thought it was loose. It was like, let's see where this goes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we, cho we chose our sort of points that we would host these chats quite well um, in terms of it was kind of in, in the middle of their, of their sort of overnight success, if you want to put it like that. Yeah. So it was almost like they weren't media trained yet. <laughs> If you if you would yeah. call them that now, I don't know, but you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and you can be media savvy, even if you're not if you're just just by the nature of having yeah. done a lot of it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think and we'd hit them at that time when maybe they hadn't. Joe had, I think, because it would it would only really be Joe that was doing the interviews at the beginning. Always the lead singer. Yeah, hundred percent. It wouldn't be anyone else, right? <laughs> I've been there. So, I've tried to speak to other band members. They just won't even talk to you half the time. Yeah, well, this was this was it. Yeah, so we were at the beginning when we were we'd set up the chats with Joe. It was almost chatting to them one by one, 
because I, I know Lee was Lee, one of the guitarists, was like, I, I don't want to, you know, you just do the film, you know, talk to Joe, you, you know, you don't need us. And it was like, I, we, I was filming them in Dublin. We went, I went to, they were supporting Future Islands. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the name of the stadium, but they were, it was like their first stadium show. Okay. And they, they were supporting Future Islands, but there wasn't like a ton of people there. And I just remember thinking, crap, this is a really bad gig to choose <laughs> to come and film them. But then, oh, then I, I, my, my sister, Sarah, she got on board with the film and helped me, helped me sort of, I think, create that narrative at the beginning. Mm. Um, she, she is one of the producers as well. She was like, Mark, it's the perfect place to film them. When, when there's, because the, what you'll see in the footage, we don't really dive into it too much, but there's not a big crowd, but they give 110%. Mm. And I remember them chatting backstage and it was annoying because I don't think I was wrong on the camera at the time. They said, listen, let's go out, give absolutely everything. Mm. And like, cause they, they, they'd acknowledged that there was, that there was, um, you know, there was no crap, there was no crowd. So it was tough, but th- that's just in their nature. While you were in Ireland playing, Lee began to take what you're doing more seriously than before in the sense of he could sense there was more than just a guy filming a band on the road. Yeah, I think so because he, it, it was the, the fact that why is this guy coming all the way to Dublin mm. filming us play a, a bit of a no show in terms of it wasn't their show. They're supporting that there wasn't a big crowd or whatever. So I think it, it just started maybe, it may be for all of them at that point, they were just like, oh, okay, he's actually making a documentary now. It mm. was different to the fun and games we were having before. Um, yeah. So I guess it, 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 it what, what I also, it was good for me then to spend time with them, which I hadn't really done before. Okay. Um, as in, you know, just hang out backstage and be with them. And there's no one else. They've not, they're not doing any interviews. It was time for me to like embed myself a little bit. And so they got comfortable. Mm. I think, I think, I think that happened that weekend. But yeah, it was good. And I got to see Future Islands play, which was great. I imagine so. I imagine so. <laughs> And 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 there are, you you tackle a lot a lot of different narratives in the thing. Least of all, each band member themselves could could tell a story. So, and Lee in particular, you could have gone off and told Lee's Lee's story as a kind of B film almost, couldn't you? I think I get the sense of. I mean, you tell us enough in the context mm. of of him joining the band and stuff, but yeah, I think it was um, it was the case that you can't tell every story. Um, and we touch upon it in the film in the sense of what Lee brought to that band wasn't just music. It was um, a turning point in Lee's life to move on from his addiction was, um, I think, for him to commit to the band, it kick-started, it almost reignited their, their faith in themselves. Mm. And that was the point. I mean, like, yeah, like you say, Lee's, I'm sure Lee will talk about it at depth and I think he has a little bit already. But it wasn't really the time, it wasn't, you know, you don't take um, every opportunity there is to, uh, if the story, if it doesn't really make sense to the story, that I didn't, I didn't want to abuse that. They'd no, let me no, in. No, no, no. And that, the, question, the question to follow that is, is, is really is, how when you're in the midst of making a making a film where there are these interesting other stories that mm. are that are in the that are in the sphere of what you're telling but aren't necessarily what you need to be telling how mm. do you keep a sort of an eye on on your bigger picture as it were it's really difficult it's really difficult and i think we had to i had to uh understand that i'm not an experienced filmmaker okay i i you know, I, I have a background in TV. I studied film at uni. It doesn't, I don't think, make you a filmmaker. You've mm. got to, you know, I'd, um, I knew enough, but I think it was also, it was also talking and getting advice from other filmmakers. Okay. So, um, who did you speak to? For example, Christine Franz, um, who did Bunch of Cunts, The Sleep of Modstock. Oh, right. Okay. Brilliant documentary amazing film she's an amazing woman and 
I remember when I started this film, I was in a company and, and, and actually it was uh, a guy who was a bit of a mentor to me at the time said, Try, speak, go speak to someone like Christine. She, Cause it was such a DIY, you know, that sort mm. of punk ethos within the film. She'll just, it will be a good chat, whatever the chat is. Mm. Um, and so over the last few years, I, me and Christine sort of, it's probably only speak about once every six months, but it was, it was so uh, reassuring for me to have speak, to speak to her about her experiences, which I was going through very similar experiences that she'd been through. Mm. Um, so it wasn't, it was never, it wasn't a case of asking her creatively, what, what do I do here? It was more like, you can do this. <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> yeah. sure, I'm sure that's part of it. Cause, cause in a yeah. way, if you're making an, a fictional film where you're, you're, you've got a, um, a shot list for the day and you've got actors on set, you know what finished looks like. Whereas if mm. you turn up to a gig in Bristol or in Leeds to cover the band, you're just, mm. you're just there to get what you can get. And if something emerges fantastic, because over mm. four years, you're going to have a lot of stuff on the, a lot more on the cutting room floor than you will on screen, won't you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what we did, <clears throat> what I also sort of decided I didn't want to do was, um, to, uh, go to the music award shows or go to the, or cover too many, um, you know, like I mentioned the Foo Fighters gig earlier. Mm. I didn't really want to cover that. I didn't really want to cover the, you know, whatever, like Jules Holland, for example. Yeah. Um, given I did try and get access to Jules Holland, didn't happen. Right. But I don't know if I don't know if it would have made it in the final cut because it's kind of taking away from the attention of what the actual film's about. Um, so, yeah, it was chats with the likes of Christine were, were just really reassuring into you know i remember her telling me once keep the blinkers on don't because you're going to have a lot of people giving you different bits of you know you steer this way you want this you want this and yeah she was like absolutely right it what that was the case and 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 in the end especially with the final edit it was me and my editor but it was basically me in an airbnb over lockdown the first one finishing it up mm. And it was, I just, I just felt like it was like the last, last man standing type thing. Like, uh, and so, yeah, she was right. And in the end, I, I, I guess I battled with confidence throughout it, but in the end, I just needed to, to get it done. As so much as it's a, a, a document of, of idols, it's also a film. So how, how were you managing to keep your eye on, the aesthetic and, and keeping it visually interesting mm. at the same time. You know, there's one thing to set a camera up and go, Hey Joe, this question, there's another question, mm. but there's another thing then to have something interesting to look at while that's all coming across. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I think it was a case that there was always something exciting going on across that time period that was happening especially with the fans. I feel like the, the, the injection that we put into the film, when, when we embraced the Afghan community and mm. we're like, this is part of the film. It's a story that's going to run parallel to the bands. And we're going to ride, we're going to just continue filming with them and ride that wave together. And we'll just see how this turns out type thing. Mm. Um, that was the energy for me because like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, films about bands and and um i i couldn't make i couldn't make a glossy movie about you know a band hitting i couldn't do that but with the fans i felt like i was i, I am one of them like and so when we were when we had their energy to feed off and the and the i guess it's a it wasn't a problem but like uh there were so many fans telling us their stories it was it was almost impossible to to pick one. It was a case of like trying to paint the bigger picture of this community through maybe two or three different stories within it, mm. um, because there are too many. There are too many to tell in one film. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, because because so, because even I mean, so Afghan is is the online community for fans of. Idols formed by Lindsay Melbourne, yeah, and it was yeah. like you said yeah, at the start. Exactly. It, it 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 evolved out of a Facebook group. And what did you say? There was thirty people when you first 
I think I think when Lindsay when when I first started speaking with Lindsay, there was about twenty six people. So now there's and thirty thousand plus. There's over thirty thousand. Yeah, <laughs> easy. <laughs> That's amazing. Which, which is insane. And and Lin, you know, Lindsay's been around uh, sort of music all her life, and she was part of the Libertines fan group, and she was you know on the road with them, and I and I, I think she just she just clocked it early. She clocked what was happening. She clocked that Joe was talking about. Men. It wasn't just about the songs either, which he mm. does talk about all these, all these themes. But it was in between the songs. It was the stuff he was saying to the crowd, to 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 their faces about like, don't be too aggressive. Look after yourself. You know, all the all mm. these little comments seep, started seeping through, and she could see people at the gigs as you know, that, that changed things. And it was something unique that she hadn't seen for a long time. And so to be honest with you, yeah, I'm really glad I dropped her a line <laughs> to me at that pub yeah. because she, she changed, she kind of changed the direction of the film in terms of its ambition and what it would be too. Okay. Um, Were you conscious of that from that conversation or is that in hindsight? No, from that conversation, as soon as she said, some of the conversations she'd be ha- she'd been having with people because to be honest with you I'm not one of those to to have those conversations with people after like I, I I'd sometimes like to dip in and dip like observe and get out that's, yeah 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 that's sort of in my in my nature um whereas Lindsay was having these conversations with people after the gigs about their lives and it, it was something would happen where where the person she would be talking to as well as herself, it would, you'd just skip the, 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 there would be no sort of niceties. It would be talking about life straight away. Mm. How, how are you? Are you okay? <laughs> and, and, and as soon as she started telling me some of the stories, I was like, damn, well, yeah, let's go. So me and Lindsay went on the road and we spent quite a few months, you know, dipping in, in and out of different cities and, meeting with the fans and getting their stories and you know not every every one's story could be told in the film but there'll be another there'll be another time for that those stories to come you know yeah i guess and again that that represents its own like another challenge for you as the filmmaker to keep to keep a lid on or keep your blinkers on as you're advised in terms of what you are trying to tell you know it is it's hard i i almost got to the point where it i i didn't want you want choice in the edit, right? Mm -hmm. You want choice to be able to, to play with because some things might not work when you think on a day you film something amazing. It might, you know, not maybe eight times out of 10, it doesn't work. I don't know. Mm. So, but these, these people were trusting me, a relative, well, an unknown human with their, with their most personal stories. And to be honest, that was the biggest takeaway for me was, was that people did that. Um, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, abuse that too much. So, so we filmed. We, you know, we filmed and we recorded with with quite a lot of them. But I didn't want to. I couldn't speak to everyone. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, of course, of course. Uh, but so when you're having these ongoing conversations with people, and obviously you're, you you suddenly become a fixture of of the band's sort of presence when when, when they're about, because like you said, the the momentum that idols seem to gather is that very natural thing in it. And it's interesting that you, you spoke to the director of the um, Sleaford Mods documentary, because I think, I think in some senses it's a very similar trajectory in, in, in that mm. it was a very local story that then got the attention of the London media and in inverted commas, which then become yeah. a, nat- a, 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 a natural national story in terms of music. Yeah. Fans. I mean, yeah. it's not everybody knows about them, but certainly, you know, you get on Jules Holland, that's a, that's a wide audience in terms of music mm. fans. Well, I guess they just kept, there was a point where, and, and you know, a, a, someone who features in the film is Steve Lamack. Mm. Um, and it was almost comical how passionate Steve got about idols mm. um, because he would mention them on like every show for years before, before they cracked it, which I don't even know what that means anymore, but before no, they, you know, yeah, before they, I don't know, whatever, got, got bigger. Um, started playing bigger shows. He would be playing them for years, and and so 
we did film with him. He was the one guy that we thought if we we're going to film with one person, like not no producers, no no ultra famous faces, like someone who would just you know the the great support of like the underdog in mm. general too. Um, and Steve was that guy because everyone takes credit, you know, a certain amount of credit, but I don't think idols would be anywhere near near uh, where they are now with, without him, mm. you know. Um, so yeah, he was uh, he was pivotal, and that's why he, that's why he's in the film, and that's why we give him his like moment to tell his pretty funny yeah, idols yeah, yeah. interaction. <laughs> well, it's it's always it's always good that it's it's like um, all 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 these things are very much they could they could have gone either way in terms of the the magic moment when it happens because life is that is that is is that flipping yeah. isn't it? Life isn't always yeah. about major plans. It's about and the magic of a band is that you catch them. And you feel like you've caught something amazing. Yeah, and I guess you know it was a, it. The, the dip, I think pros bring a little extra to everything they do. So do we. It's called Pro Extra, the Home Depot's loyalty program built just for pros. Members earn perks just for shopping, like Pro Extra dollars or tool rental credit, plus other great benefits that save time and money. With Pro Extra, the more you spend, the more you earn. Get $20 off your next purchase of $200 or more just for signing up. Pro Extra, only at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Sign up on the Home Depot mobile app. Hey, we get it. You don't want to be hearing a progressive commercial right now. So let us tell you something you do want to hear. You are intelligent. You make all the right decisions. You were smart before smart was cool, and you made it cool again. You have a wealth of knowledge, and you are so very clever. <laughs> I bet you already knew I was going to say that, you genius. There, don't you feel better? You'll also feel better when you hear you could save big when you switch to Progressive. But I'm pretty sure you already knew that, too. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. What people don't appreciate is, is how long they were together before they before they got their shit together, really, mm. like, you know, it was seven, uh, seven years or so where they, where they just couldn't, they could, they couldn't find their identity or maybe they were building towards it. You know? Um, I mean, all, all decent bands of any, of any, with worth any, with any of their salt are tend to be a five to 10 year overnight sensation. Don't they? I mean, oh, it's kind of like mm. the reason they're good is because they've been doing it a while, not because they're good. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. <clears> yeah. I w- what I was going to say when I was rattling on with myself was was how did your interviewing get easier or harder as they become more interviewed by the media at large? Because obviously if they're growing, that means more people want their attention. At the start, you'd have been fighting off student magazines and fanzines and maybe the odd <laughs> music mag. Then yeah. you're going to be then you've got national the national and international media that want a piece of it as well. And you're yeah. there sticking your camera in the face. So yeah, it's interesting that you say that because there were there were moments that I was trying to get to film. And like I said, with the Jules Holland, that was just one of the examples. Mm. But there were other moments where it was like, you just can't come. I think they were doing, it was either six music live lounge or maybe the radio one live lounge or something. I was trying to get in there and they were just like too many people. And I got that towards, towards the end of the time I spent filming with them. It was more and more like, there's just, you can't, mm. <laughs> you can't get in here. In terms of the interviews, I guess it's a bit different because um, so the setup that we had on the road was because I we didn't have like a cameraman like as such. It was like I was shooting a lot of it, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I can shoot, but I wouldn't call myself a cameraman, you know. Um, so my like we got the uh, for the uh, interview setups we got the kit from my sister's company that she was working at the time uh they lent it to us and we and her and they would let her and uh her, one of her colleagues who's a sound man who's probably more of a cameraman than I am mm. come with the kit and we would set up and between the three of us you know I would be I would be chatting with my sister or Lindsay, whoever was coming on the road, because I would be on the camera. One of them would be hosting the interviews a lot of the time. Sometimes I did it by myself and it was like messy, but, um, but um, yeah. So, but, but, but my sister and, and me, we, we've known the band forever. So it was kind of like, as long as we sat with them long enough, you, after about two minutes, you'd get the less professional answer. 
Got you. It would be like it would be it would be more relaxed, mainly because we had that relationship with them before. So it, it felt it felt quite personal straight off, straight off the bat. Now, it, obviously, in hindsight, it's very truthful to the band um, because of certainly because of the way that they sort of address mental health in their lyrics, the, the formation of the Afghan and and what they say about the band and what the band say to them. Um, but you, you've got two, is it two or three instances of death in families that, that happen yeah. while you're making this film that you yeah. give time to with to let them talk about it. Or they, or they want to talk about it one, one or the other. Um, have you got? I mean, I'd be interested to see what your advice is really about. Because I mean, you've got the you've got the history with the band, so you're not just somebody coming in cold saying, "Tell me about how sad you're feeling," kind of thing. You're not. You're not. You're not. Mm. It's not opportunistic. It's you're there, and it's mm. this is what's happening while you're making your film. But mm. what what's your advice to a filmmaker? You know, faced with that kind of very real, raw story that's that's fast emerging alongside this fantastical story of a band on the rise yeah i guess you you've got to have your moral compass point in the right way yeah from like and um you've i, I think i remember uh chatting with joe and just saying we won't ever tell this in a, in an untrue like we won't ever mold this into something else other than what what it is mm. because the other thing and, and I, there was a reason to tell it. There was a reason to tell those stories in that Joe didn't come saying, oh, tell, you know, tell this story, tell that story. It wasn't that. It, the reason for people that were that knew idols when they were coming up, part of the reason, you know, he, he spoke about it in, in interviews around the time. It, that was more the reason as to why people were responding to them. Yes. It was, it, people, people would relate and I think it's that basic thing of when you talk about some something, someone someone will be listening. And uh, and I, I think there was um, there was maybe a moment of um, realization for that from the band in that they could help people mm. by speaking about it, not just on stage but off. I mean, there's a beautiful song called June on Joy as an act of resistance on the second album. Mm. Uh, which is about the death of his still of his stillborn um, mm. Agatha. I I didn't feel the need to put that in the film. Um, you know, people would say at that moment because because we tell that story. I didn't feel like it was it was necessary. There wasn't a reason to put it in mm. other than make you ball your freaking eyes out. Yeah, there was, there was no, and that, that's that's not a reason. That's not a, you know. So I, I, there was that respect, that respect, and that um, I guess between us, and that trust that we 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 wouldn't go to that place if the opportunity arise. We wouldn't go there. We mm. would tell the story as it is. Like um, so, yeah. I I had I had an experience actually on this short film that was unreleased a few years ago, and it was um, about this boxing gym in Wandsworth in London. Right, and uh, it was. It was the most sort of bizarre experience, and it, it's it relates to this how how I think I could get Joe's trust and the band's trust as well. Not they didn't know this, but um, she had a horrific sort of personal loss, um, and I had no, I had nothing. I just went with the camera, and I was just like, I, I found out about her story. Uh, from going to the boxing gym and she just said you can as, like tell it as long as you tell it truthfully and I just had this amazing sort of t- like a year a year or so where I just kept going to this boxing gym and we would chat and she and she would just let me in mm. and so I think I gained a lot from that in that you know the nothing your film is never going to be bigger than someone's life or so, someone's story yeah, yeah um cool. so so when someone does let you in, that's that's a responsibility in a way that that you've got to really value and respect. And you know, there was another moment in the Idols film where we've got we've got um, we've got something that Joe says on film that it would have it would have destroyed everyone type thing, but it wasn't it wasn't necessary for the story of the film. So you know, I think it's that balance yeah. that balance of finding the truth without you don't have to reveal 
everything to you know you don't have to put everything out there you don't have to you get that emotion from yeah i mean i must admit i wasn't i didn't feel watching the film was lacking any nuance about how tragic it is to lose your child i mean it, it, yeah no no you i know, know it's kind know. of the the film tells you yeah. you know and obviously it's in the context of what is a rock documentary so it's like this is what it look what we're seeing is what it looks like in in the life of a rock band not like that that's yeah. particularly special or unique in terms of but it because that's because it becomes a universal truth doesn't it then it's like suddenly it's just a fella who would have been a father had that child survived yeah, kind of thing. So, and that's not a that's not rock band specific at all it's just human no and i guess i guess the fairly interesting thing about that period of filming was i that was the the filming at alexandra palace hmm. was about three weeks after um agatha's death and but i'd chosen that date prior to knowing about it as the first day I wanted to film with them as they were finally getting somewhere in London. And that was like my full story for the short film. Mm. So I, ch- I picked that date and, and I don't think I found out until that day that that had happened. So that was the first, that the first day. And you see, it's right. It's, you know, it, it, it was, I think that was a, I, yeah, in some way, a, a weird beginning for my journey with the band. It, it kind of glued me in quite early on because I was just around yeah, I at that yeah, time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, all, but from a, from a kind of, I mean, I would only class myself as uh, you know, given the the presence of the Af- Afghan. I mean, I'm I'm essentially idol curious in comparison. Um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and I, and, and, and while I, I I love the song Mother, I didn't realise this. I mean, and, and it's powerful. And the message is clear, but I hadn't realised how powerful it was and how much of a celebration it was of someone's life, as much as it, it was, until until you watch the film. Yeah, or, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't because I, I just yeah. the song was just in a song on the album, and I enjoyed the chorus and and it and it felt powerful Funny, to me. But then yeah. it's now since watching the film, mm. it's now got a, an absolutely heightened meaning to it. In fact, weirdly, <clears throat> the the joy of the song for me originally was just you know. The, make some uh, read and make money, and you can kill a Tory, and that always yeah. that always that always entertained me. But that now, always works. But now I'm now I'm now I'm thinking more of who the protagonist of the story is in that song, and it's his mother, and and that yeah, kind of thing. and I think that's really yeah. powerful. I think that's it, and like um, that song in particular, I think it's got to be my favorite track, probably. Mm. If just I don't, it, it just hits so many sort of, um, it's so many core themes that I don't know that speaks to me personally but yeah that um it was just a it was so powerful and that was another example of Joe let, let, letting us have the creative freedom because he he said I've got this VHS te- uh, tape up in the attic because I said have you got any footage of your mum mm. you know um and he said I've got this tape and then he pretty much just sent it to us so that you can use what you want on it you, whatever's on it wow. use it i think uh so yeah i feel like um if uh yeah we had that separation but also that creative freedom to do what we like so that you know it, it was amazing to actually put cuz yeah put a, put some um put a face you know to that to that story because uh that's just. Uh, I think everyone can relate somewhat, you know. No, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, yeah. And and then go back to sort of the the, the, the sort of ascendancy of the band. What's what's mm. interesting, and this is. I mean, I'm kind of a kind of. I'm, I'm obsessed with the idea of how people in the creative industries sort of chisel out their their little their little avenue. Not everybody can be you two or Picasso, but we can certainly be, you know, the idols and. Somebody else who's not as famous as Picasso, um, yeah. <laughs> but but one of the things that's clear when you're watching the ascendancy of the band is that a it takes time and but also one thing that I've learned from from other people I've had advice from is patience and consistency also play a crucial part in what becomes that success down the road. Mm. It's like it's not like you were going and the band were once like this and then they were like that. Then they, the the nature of what they were was growing from that first seed. It was just like, like you said earlier on, it was more like they didn't quite know what it was, but they, they kind of had a sense of where it was going. So they just kept almost like, I mean, I'm putting this on the film now and on the, on the band, but, but it certainly felt like, right. it certainly felt like 
there's a belief, and and I guess you've got to be somehow deluded to, to in in a, in a healthy sense to yeah. to want to to pursue something where the the outcome isn't oh you're very good here here's a check because yeah. you've got all the other variables including Joe Public that's going to decide yeah, yeah, whether yeah. or not you get a check of I, any description. I think that there there was a line in a film that did it for me, um, and it was I think Joe says something like you know it was when the first album had just come out. And he was doing a radio interview and he just goes, listen, we're like an eight out of 10 band at the moment. And that's fine. Mm. We'll get, you know, we'll keep going. Like, it doesn't matter. Like it, that's what we are right now. It's fine. Mm. Like, and, and I think, um, I think Joe was that person, was that person, is that person maybe still like who drove, who drove that, the belief. It really came through Joe. Like, you know, um, cause there were plenty of times where they were just drunk on stage or, you know, messing up. It wasn't, and I think I think that is that. I don't know whether it's a geographical thing as well from Bristol, I, as in like coming for a city where there, there's not a not a ton of bands that make it out of Bristol. Mm. The scene the scene's amazing. It's yeah, like yeah. right, it's got it's great, but not a ton of bands hit maybe the height, the the, the larger heights, whatever that is. Mm. Um, and I think I think they really did believe in that. And and I think part of the thing that drew me to them as well was their age because they weren't 21 year old kids when they started with a band. They mm. were maybe in their mid to late twenties, but then by the time they were maybe just scratching the surface in their like mid early thirties. So it was like, these are guys that aren't giving up. Mm. They're not going to, they're not going to take no as an answer. Yeah. So they, so I was, I think that just uh, inspired me just as like a message to anyone. I mean, just and, and like, again, there's there's parallels with uh, with Sleeper Mods, isn't it? It's like the, mm. the the idea of having lived a life as well as created a band is quite mm. a foundation that's not to be underestimated. And, and also it's not about being, it isn't about the ambition to suddenly be you too. It's actually, if you can make this machine work, I mean, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite bands is The Fall, and famously, yeah. he had an album it, out called 50,000 Fall Fans Can't Be Wrong. So it's like he was never trying to be yeah. you too, but as long as he serviced 50,000 fans, it was it was a going concern that is a rare thing that, in any creative industry. Yeah, 100%. And Idols support, I saw Idols support The Fall. Oh, really? Um, oh, God, I can't even remember the year, but it was a long time ago. And, um, and he was hilarious. Um, Marky Smith mm. was hilarious because like, I remember Dev was saying uh, this is like one of their idols too of you course know? yeah I imagine and, um, yeah yeah and uh, I think they were all super nervous to be around him super like cautious didn't want to piss him off too much or whatever mm. and um, <laughs> I remember Dev was telling us a story that he, he was ha- while Marky Smith was playing uh, Dev was just having a cigarette outside like what a crazy night this is mad just like by himself and then Marky Smith whilst the gig is playing just burst through the back door and he's like you right, man and Dev's like are you not meant to be on stage like <laughs> right now <laughs> and, uh, and he just had enough he just had one of those nights where he'd had enough of you know playing so he just I think he had shared a cigarette with Dev or something and that was that but uh, I went, it's to, I went that- to Marky Smith's book launch and he didn't turn up for his own book launch yeah, he was so happy yeah. at the pub, he just thought he couldn't be asked. Apparently, but isn't that ethos kind of refreshing, man? It's so nice. I, I feel like uh, maybe not everyone can do that, but um, I, I think um, maybe they took something from that night in that they just got to pave pave your own path. Yeah, because if it if because the other thing is you 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 don't want to live a life that how valuable can your life be if you're not being true and to yourself at least? No, no. So they, if all you do is please everybody, you're never going to please which, yourself. Yeah. And which that's not is, to say you have to be an arrogant prick, but no, but there comes a point well, they, where they can be sometimes. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be in a band if you weren't to some degree. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it yeah. comes with the territory because it isn't, it is, yeah. there isn't, there isn't like some electric shock you get and then you're ready to go on stage. There's still a human emotion. I mean, I've, I've, I've managed the band in the past and it's sort of, you know, the personalities and stuff. It's, mm-hmm. it's, an, it's not, it's what I learned through, through working with a band is it's, whereas when you know them as a band on stage, they look amazing. Then you get to know the people and they're still brilliant people. Mm-hmm. You realize there's four different personalities 
who who were getting ready to go on stage. And that's like four people getting ready to go to work. Yeah, a hundred percent. And they've all got their own different, you know, tactics to g themselves up. And you know, I guess one of the one of the Bowen, who's the Irishman, who mm. used to be a dentist, who plays a lot in his pants. Yeah. He probably won't do much anymore. I think he's had enough of it. But uh, he he's pretty shy, like off stage. He's he's not. He's one of those. He comes like he really feels it on stage. He mm. almost like channels channels his dreams or whatever it is, and he and he lets it out. But um, yeah, I think that was one of the thing with uh, one of the things as well with with idols is it took them a lot uh, quite some time naturally to all find their own uh, elements that they could bring mm. to the band and make that gel because I think that's just an ongoing thing like you know with their last album they're finding musically where they can give each other breaks and allow themselves to express themselves and hold them back you know speak uh, John like the drummer I know that sometimes they like to hold him back and then maybe, you know, unleash him sometimes. It, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it, but they're learning that as they go. They're not, you know, and you can hear it in their albums, which, are, which is a kind of a really cool thing. No, no totally. And, and I think in a way it's, I, I, you, I saw a similar sort of trajectory with, with sort of bands that arrived ready, ready formed. I mean, it just as in their experience, they weren't wet behind the ears. Like yeah. you think of like how, um, when the White Stripes broke, there was mm. two albums sort of already in the can. So they knew what mm. they wanted to do, but then you see how that music changes as they become more assured yeah. and stuff, or or even like the direction the Arctic Monkeys have gone into now. It's like it's unrecognizable yeah. from where they were, but it's still but still them. It's still the Arctic Monkeys. So I think it's great yeah. that, that that they can find that between each other. Um <clears throat> let's remind people then, uh, when can they see your film? So they can, well, it's out in cinemas. You'll be able to get tickets from the 23rd of June previews. Mm. Second, of, uh, 2nd of July is the cinema release date across the UK. And then it'll be online or, or physical will be out on the 6th of August. Is that right? Stuart? It is. Yes. 6th of August. You're doing <laughs> right, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now one last question uh, before we sign off. Um, you said that, uh, John, John's your friend from going back when. Yeah, yeah. And obviously doing a documentary about John being a, ba- John, a band that, that John's in. Yeah. What would you say you learned about your friend that you didn't know before? Having no, Honestly, nothing. Seriously? No, absolutely. There was nothing. Because he, I think maybe what I learned from it was that he, he has kept his feet entirely rooted on the ground. Yeah. Like it, he, we wouldn't, when in the making of the film, we'd never speak about it. I remember for the Foo Fighters gig, basically I, I have this thing where I don't, I never, apart from occasionally when I, I would film them for their dates, I would always pay for that, a ticket. I would never ask for hmm. a guest list or anything from the early days to like now. So I kind of regretted it on the Foo Fighters gig though, because that was like 70 quid. So oh. I feel like, uh, yeah, a bit too much. But um, in terms of what, what, yeah, John, me and him have just, it's been the same relationship since, since we were kids. And, and, uh, and he's just got his feet on the ground everywhere. He's just a nice guy. It's really irritating, actually. He's just <laughs> a nice guy. Well, let me flip, yeah. let me flip it back around then on you. You, 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 at the start, you said you didn't know what you were really getting yourself into and it, it yeah. and it mushroomed into this feature film. So having made the feature film and now basking in its glory of having done it, what could you what could you say that you 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 found out about yourself that you didn't know? Um, it's tricky. I grew a lot in terms of just just internally on, uh, throughout this whole process. Yeah, and I made a ton of mistakes probably, mm. and didn't deal with everything the way I should have done and stuff like that. But I think. I think looking back on it, I mean, I'm I'm amazed that we've got it finished and done. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. because you know, there's been making a DIY film like this. We didn't really get any external finance or anything like that, so it was it was really DIY. It was tough, you know. I like uh, I I took time off my TV sort of side of things, and I worked with my mate who's a builder. And actually, freaking, although I can't lift crap <laughs> i actually really enjoyed the process but i realized that i would just do anything to get it done 
mm. at that point. I'll just whatever, whatever will get the film done, I'll get it done. So I guess that um, that determination that sometimes you do. It, it's funny. I watched a film and it's really annoying because I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I think it's the it's the director who who made Drive and works with Ryan Gosling a lot. And Nicholas Wine and Revin. Yeah, what it, the, one film, made, the one his wife made. The one his wife made while he was doing Only God Forgives. Yes, exactly. Yeah, mm. that film. I remember I was going through this phase of being like, oh, screw everything. Like, what's the point? No one cares. You know, I was being all self pitiful and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, I'm like, and the editor Tom that made, worked in the film, he was like, watch this film, just watch it. And uh, that's some good advice I could give to anyone, actually. Like, <laughs> is watch that film because he's an unbelievable filmmaker. And you just see we all talk the same crap, no matter what level you're on. Yeah, We're all going to bed feeling, what's the point? There's, you know, it, no one cares about this thing. If I stop now, it won't get, ever get fair. Blah, blah, blah. You know, you get over yourself. And at the end of the day, that's it was a lovely thing that the wife had made it as well because my partner lived through this whole process mm. too. So I also learned that my partner can deal with a lot, a lot of crap as well as me, you know, he- hearing me talk rubbish about it every day. But it's one of those things that um, I'm, I couldn't be happy that it's done. I, it's still surreal that it's going to hit the cinema. Uh, it's mad that people are going to watch it. And I just hope people enjoy it. Well, look, Mark, I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you told yourself to keep going. It's a, it was a joy to watch. <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, thank you very much for giving your time on the BritFlix podcast. No worries. I appreciate it. Thank you. Get more out of summer with more from the Home Depot and 4th of July savings throughout the store and online. Whether you're ready to paint a wall, upgrade an appliance, fire up a new grill, or spread color throughout your garden, the Home Depot can help you match low prices with your high expectations for your next project. Whatever plans you have for your home, you can make this a summer to remember. With the Home Depot, how doers get more done. We saved big money with our progressive home and auto bundle and used the cash to take a family vacation. To Hawaii. Who's up for a luau? Yay! This is not a real testimonial. Sure, customers can save big money with progressive, but not enough to go to Hawaii. They'll probably use it for things like the mortgage and groceries or even a travel magazine, so at least they can see pictures of Hawaii. Aloha! (laughs) Yes, say hello to those beautiful Hawaiian beaches in that magazine. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates.